Welcome back to the latest edition of the OmniTalk Fast Five, sponsored by Fast Sensor and Takeoff. It is September 24th, 2020. I am joined, of course, as always, by my partner in crime, Anne Mazinga. It's been a rough one already. We're barely getting through this, but oh, good yeah. morning. This is take th- we're on take three of just the opening here. And of course, Emma, the intern. Hi, everyone. I believe in you, Chris. Thanks. I'll get through this at some point. I appreciate the, appreciate the signs of moral support. But hey, man, it's been a good morning already, though, I will say. And I got to tell you, I just listened to your latest Women's Retail Collective podcast with Sephora SVP, Allison Hahn. Nicely done, my friend. That thing is great. Yeah, thanks. Allison Hahn, who you met back in your days where you're taking dates to look at your jean stacks at The Gap. Uh, yeah, she's amazing. I mean, it was a really fun conversation. And I, I think I said it when I posted on LinkedIn, but that one conversation felt like she's been a mentor for years, like the amount of, of just insight and advice that she gives um, just based on her own experience was very candid and genuine. And it was a great interview. So thank you, Allison, if you're listening. Yeah. And if people, if you're listening and you have a chance to check it out, please do. It's live on, on OmniTalk right now, omnitalk.blog. But Allison Sephora, long career in retail, started a career at Macy's, then went to The Gap. That's where I met her. She makes a joke in the podcast of working uh, with me when I was 12 years old, which, is, which, is, which made me chuckle this morning as I was listening to it. Uh, but it's just a ton of good insights. Like for me, I love the part two where she talks about there's a real big difference between the delivery of ideas and the actual ideas themselves and how the former probably matters more than just being right at the end of the day, which is really when we started this thing. And uh, that's really what OmniTalk was always about. I mean, our original saying was, it's not whether you're right or wrong. It's the conversation that matters. And, and those are the most important things. So for sure. Yeah. Seems All right. Well, check it out. Yeah. Very good stuff. Good stuff. Kudos to you, my friend. All right. Well, we've got you guys, we've got some feel good stories today. Today's a little bit different. Like, you know, COVID's happening. The world feels like it's falling apart and it got a whole host of ways, but there's some exciting feel-good stories. We're going we're gonna to start with two feel-good stories in the beginning, and then we're actually going to end with a really good feel-good story from Walmart this week as well. So first, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors. As I mentioned before, our sponsors are FastSensor. FastSensor is the first AI-powered business intelligence platform that provides business owners with ROI-focused optimization tools tailored to fit your organization. With FastSensor, you can successfully monitor safety, efficiency, and journeys across your organization from customer flow to queue management to the effectiveness of digital signage and promotions. You can visit FastSensor.com to learn more. And if you recall, this summer, we also sat down with FastSensor's Kalen Welch to discuss how FastSensor is providing its solutions for social distancing and contact tracing during the pandemic. If you haven't listened to that podcast already, highly encourage you to do so. And it can be found again on omnitalk.blog. And always take off. Take off is transforming grocery by empowering grocers to thrive online. The key is micro fulfillment, small robotic fulfillment centers that can be leveraged at a hyper local scale. Takeoff also offers a robust software suite so grocers can seamlessly integrate the robotic solution into their existing businesses. To learn more, visit takeoff.com. And you can also read my latest white paper, The Three Ways Takeoff's Latest Research Changed My Thinking About E-Groceries, also on OmniTalk, one of my favorite pieces I've written all of this year. Okay, Ann, feel good story number one. Let's do it. (laughs) Yeah, are you guys ready for the feel good fast five? Let's share some good. Let's do it. All right, you guys. The first story of today is, again, about Minnesota's Mall of America. They made an announcement this week that they are going to be dedicating retail space, which they're calling community commons, to shops in Minneapolis and St. Paul whose businesses have been disrupted by the pandemic and also social unrest brought about by the killing of George Floyd. So this will be located on level two south. It's 5,000 square feet. They're going to have 17 shops uh, selling apparel and accessories, art, culture, food, beverage, personal care, you name it. But Community Commons tenants will be in the space now through spring of 2021. Emma, what it's awesome news. Emma, what do you think? I love this. I mean, kudos to Mall of America for taking what was an empty space because I'm 97% sure this is the four post space. So it's already built for this. And then just, I give Mall of America a ton of credit to help these retailers that are struggling, especially if they pull in any from the areas that were really kind of destructed 
due to the social unrest. But yeah, creds to them. Yeah, I, yeah, Ann and I, we even, we did, you know, we said, Ann and I, I remember in the, in the show prep, we were saying, you know, should we include this story? We just did a story on Mall of America in live streaming a couple of weeks ago. And we were like, yeah, no, you know what? We need to because this story is super cool. And we made a promise to our listeners and subscribers that we're going to put a focus on these types of stories. And the Mall of America is doing something that's really cool. And you're right. Yeah, it's in the, I think it's most likely, and it sounds like it's in the former four, four post uh, location, which for those of you who remember was kind of the neighborhood goods uh, style department store that was created by Mark Germazian that was there for a time. And so it's, it's just built to house this. I think the thing that I just love about it too is it gives me a reason to want to go to the mall. Like I, and I think that's something that a lot of developers and people can think about in terms of, you know, how do you showcase the things in the community communities that matter to people? Yes, it's about products and things I want to shop for, but it's also about you know, what different things can stand for inside of how those operations work. And that's what I hope people take away, at least from my perspective, you know, on this one. And any other closing thoughts? Yeah, I mean, just to tease, um, we actually interview, um, I interviewed Jill, Jill Renslow, the EVP of business development from All of America, who's kind of leading this effort on their behalf a couple of weeks ago. And she was telling me about this and she said they got a ton of, of applications from a lot of businesses. So it's good to hear that, you know, this could be an opportunity that if it works for everybody involved, could extend beyond the spring of, of 2021. And certainly Mall of America has the marketing resources to help drive awareness about this, like you said, drive people to the mall. But what I think is even more important to think about too is what this means uh, as an example for what could happen in malls around the rest of the country. Not just, you know, our, we obviously were affected by everything in Minneapolis pretty significantly, but I think that uh, there's an opportunity to bring this style of market place and business um, into malls beyond this. And they'll learn quite a bit from, from facilitating this, from you know, bringing people in, giving people a reason to support their local communities, uh, even though it's not in, embedded in the communities themselves, but kind of broadening the, the customer base for these businesses. So um, yeah, really great to see. And uh, I'm, I'll be going there next week. So I'm going to try to take some video and get awesome. some uh, OmniTalk listener and subscribers some real access to these stores so look for that yeah, yeah there's just something about the why there i think you're right that just you know that captures me relatively speaking to like how i generally think of a mall in terms of which is really just you know national retail at scale brought to my local community this you know this just has a different hook that feels a little bit different and it also feels like something people can imitate so yeah kudos out can't wait for your interview with jill renslow uh that should be coming up in uh was we'll probably release that in october yep. uh, as part of the next uh round in uh ann's uh Women's Retail Collective Series, which we just talked about with uh, Allison Hahn. All right, I've got story number two. This is like we said, it's another feel-good story, or at least I think it is. I'm not sure yet what Anne and Emma, the intern, think, so I'm dying to see what they say. But Jeff Bezos this week announced the first ever Bezos Academy, a preschool for students from low-income families. According to Forbes, the preschool will have a year-round curriculum five days a week for children three to five years old. According to what is called affectionately the Bezos Day One website, the team selected to put its first preschool in Des Moines, not Iowa, where I was born, but Washington, a town to the south of Seattle based on income levels, rates of participation in free and reduced cost meal programs, gaps in access to licensed childcare providers, and also buy-in from local businesses who will support the growth of the preschool. I think this is great, but Anne, I'm curious because I know you had some thoughts initially, but I know you've dug into this a little bit more. Do you think this is awesome or is this, you know, the Howard, is this Jeff Bezos' Howard the Duck? Shout out to Gary Newberry for that reference. Oh my God, I don't even know. You're going to have to explain that reference. Howard the Duck. So here, here's what I mean by that exactly. Yeah, thanks. So you all remember that movie from the 80s, Emma the Intern. I'm sure you have no idea what I'm talking <laughs> about. But Howard the Duck was one of the most notorious bombs in movie history. And the reason, one of the reasons George Lucas did it is he thought it was going to be very successful. He, he had just built a $50 million Skywalker ranch and he thought it was going to pay off all his debt. So my <laughs> question is, is this Bezos Howard the Duck where he thinks this is going to pay off his debt, but his debt is really in the court of public perception. Yes, yes. that might be a stretch, but I was challenged by one of our listeners and I made it happen. So Anne, what's your take? Thank you for the explanation. Now that makes much more sense. And yes, when I did first read this, I was like, 
Oh, it's so much about Jeff Bezos. It's not about the actual good that this program is doing or that Amazon and all of its success is able to give and hopefully expand across the country. Um, but I think that at, the, at its core, the mission is good. I'm willing to overlook how much Jeff Bezos's name is being slapped all over this story uh, for what I believe will be the good that it, it uh, should do for early education. However, there are still a few creepy things about this. Like in one of the uh, interviews, Jeff Bezos said that like, we're going to be treating the children as like customers. Like, ee, okay. But I mean, I think this goes back to this bigger, broader story of the privatization of healthcare, of education, and Amazon being a company that's successfully run a retail and e-commerce operation, like to the point where now their founder is, you know, going to be a trillionaire, one of the first trillionaires we've ever had. Um, what does this mean for the future of some of these programs that were run by the government if Amazon is able to come in and do them a thousand times better and it's free? So I think that, you know, part of me is still a little like, uh, tinfoil hat what's going to happen but at the same time like for right now i'm just going to try to be calm and enjoy the happiness that these children and parents who now have daycare year round and and access to care for their three to five year olds I'm, so, I'm so so net net you're tilting on the positive like if my hands are a meter <laughs> for watching on video you're like on the positive side here emma are you uh, yeah the same way yeah i mean overall if they can pr pr provide a good early learning um, curriculum for these kids at such a critical time for kids to start learning and it'll set them up for success in the future. I do, however, I mean, like, shut up, Jeff Bezos. You have to name it the Bezos Academy. And I hate that he can do anything he wants. But overall, I believe. I thought that too, Emma. But then I started to look at some of the other ones that you have, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, yeah. like all these other yeah. ones, they're using the name. And I, I thought too, I'm like, you know, shouldn't it be more about the broader like business of Amazon and the Amazon employees that are working to make this company so successful? But yeah, I think, you know, it is what it is. Look at every, you know, hall in at every college campus that's named yeah. after some, you know, wealthy investor benefactor. Yeah, I think you lose your philanthropist card if you don't name it after yourself. It's something right. like that. But, you know, my favorite quote from the article, though, is actually something he said back in 2000. I thought this was really interesting. So it's old, but they referenced it, which was, and this is Bezos, I don't actually know what scientific research shows, but intuitively I have to imagine that it's good for little kids. And in the same interview, he also recalled tracing out letters on sandpaper and pinning on a big easel as, you know, pretty momentous events in his life. So I thought that was interesting because it draws the distinction between data and science, which, you know, you think of Amazon and it's so scientific in its leanings, but I mean, I have, I have trouble faulting anybody that's trying to do this. Um, and it also, I think it shows you two things. One, it shows you the power, how much power billionaires and millionaires can have in terms of moving this forward and looking at the scales of the investments in terms of some of the other public programs we have. And I wish, you know, maybe to some degree, there was more things like this or more people taking a stand to do things like this. But I think the second piece is it's one of those things, again, it just makes it so hard for me to really hate on Amazon. Like, you know, he has this relentless focus on the customer at all costs. And if, the, if you really believe in the customer doing what's right for the customer and you constantly are actually doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's where I still have trouble. Like, tell me an example where he's not really doing that for me. Well, and think it's of how great those five-year-old children who are also customers will be when they are 18-year-olds spending money on the Amazon platform. I mean, they, they got to love it. It's all virtual. Like, it's all that cycle again. But like, yeah, that just the value they continue to create, you know, in a lot of ways is just, it's impressive. And I know there's a lot of other things about it. And we've talked about that, that on the show, but I think these first two stories are pretty feel good. And, and we'll end with, like I said, at the end with, with another feel good story. But Another big trend that we're going to hit on now is stories number three and four is really around these ideas of marketplaces, which is something that is just blowing up. So Emma. All right. So this next story is about GOAT. The GOAT group, best known for its online marketplace for sneakerheads, has raised $100 million in a Series E funding round to further its expansion into new apparel and product categories, as well as its efforts to work with more brands to sell their products directly on its platform. I love this story. I think this is awesome for GOAT. And I really think that GOAT has the potential to really dominate this secondhand, either sneaker or like hype apparel marketplace. 
especially if they can work with a company like Flight Club. Flight Club, yep, that's it. Yes, <laughs> Flight Club. Okay. Hard to say. Also said I, know, as. I was like Fight Club, Flight Club. <laughs> anyway, if they can work with a company like that to get those new sneakers on their platform, I think that it'll be total domination. It's a much better, it's a much easier way to shop than StockX has, and you have the confirmation of authenticity, which gives you that advantage over Grailed. But yeah, I love this. And if they can get into apparel and even make their own apparel and products, I really think this is awesome. Oh, wow. You can see that too. Yeah. I mean, Emma, you, you follow Emma, the intern, you follow this space probably closer than Anne and I do. I would say of the three of us, you're probably following, you know, the fashion, fashion space the most out of all of us or definitely more than I am. Um, like, how do you, how do you take this? Like you mentioned some of the competitors, like, and how do you think about just the, in terms of like high end fashion starting to sell through this exact, you know, kind of same type of you know, mindset where, you know, it's limited, you got to get it, you got to get it while you can. Like, how do you think about that in terms of how this is all going to play out? I love it. I mean, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is that when you do these limited drops, you are doing, it's a much more like sustainable practice of fashion, where there's not mm. just thousands and thousands of products being made, but it just makes shopping exciting. And it definitely brings that excitement to the online world of shopping. And I think that that people want something more. I know, especially people in my generation, they want more than just scrolling through a website or walking through a store. They want that exclusivity that these kind of things can do. And it's like gambling. It's like shopping and yeah. gambling all mixed into one. Like, can you be first to get it? And how long do you wait before you decide you're going to pull the trigger and hit buy? Like, I don't know. There's a lot of entertainment value, I think, in addition to all the, the other things that you mentioned, Emma, as well. Yeah, and it's also, also from like the back end, it's also a little bit easier to operationalize when you think about the supply chain complexities of having to move units to you know very different many different locations to sell versus like hey you got the drop it is where it is you sell it it's really no different than like a catalog business at the end of the day you just got to get it to where it you know ultimately to whomever actually ultimately is purchasing it so yeah i think i think this stuff is really interesting i think it's only going to explode the other coincidentally it's not a headline but the other thing i think omni talk listeners and watchers should know is miracle uh, the new startup, which is in the marketplace space. And Anna, I know you know more about this too, that you can share that they just got $300 million in series D funding, yep. which is, you know, kind of the whole other angle of just how do we allow, enable large businesses, whether B2B or B2C to create marketplaces again on their own. Yeah. I think the thing though, to be really careful of is for me, like goat is like a Nike. And yep. so I think that we're just going to have to watch how this kind of evolves. I mean, Allbirds said this week they're coming out with their own app. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know that every brand is going to have the ability or the cachet to like demand this. You have like Goat already has 30 million followers. The really? tech, like Emma was saying, is um, impeccable. The shopping experience is great. You know, you already have that hook. And so I think that it makes sense for them to kind of expand the portfolio. Um, but I, I will get into the story next too, but I think that for me, it brings up this question. You mentioned miracle of like marketplaces being this new virtual mall. And I'm starting to think of each of these kind of one-off apps as like the new department stores or the new stores in that marketplace or mall. And for, I mean, I'm, I guess I'll ask the question of you guys now, but like how many, if, if they're all virtual, how many department stores or like specialty apps do we really need? Like, did we need Macy's, Dillard's, JC Penney's and, you know, a Nordstrom? Like, what is this going to look like now? And for me, I think like that makes this story really exciting because the, the future is going to be so, so different. But Chris, you look like you have something to say. So No, I think you're, it's so funny. I think like exactly right. Yeah, because I literally wrote in my notes for this too. It's funny that you were thinking the same thing. Like I really wrote, you know, are we looking at the future, the mall of the future here, so to speak, right? Like, and, yeah. and you went about who grabs up all this quote unquote real estate, although it's not physical real estate, it's really, you know, like Carter always used to talk about, it's like digital mind share. Mm -hmm. And like, and, and your point about like, where does the consolidation happen? What, what businesses can stand alone? Like can go stand alone over time? Does it get acquired? You know, who else goes into it? Can existing brands do this themselves? I think that's really fascinating to watch because I, I think to your point, and we talked about this a little bit with Nike, what was it like three or four weeks ago? Yeah. You know, and you just brought, and you brought them up again. It's like, there aren't that many brands that can probably do this on their own. 
So who is going to carve out that niche? Like, I'm curious to even think, am I see you shaking your head? Like who even some of those, you know, in reality could even be, you know, in, in this type of, sp- and, and is it just a space that's endemic to fashion, which is traditionally what's been in the malls? I think there's just so much happening here. And God, I think as I was thinking about this, some of these valuations actually might be as astronomical as they are, could actually be kind of low when you think about the long-term play here. And we haven't even like, you know, and we'll talk about this probably in the next one. We haven't even talked about Shopify, but maybe we go there. Let's go to the next story because I think it just broadens out the conversation. Sure. So the next story, Centennial, a real estate investment firm, they have a national portfolio of shopping, dining, entertainment, and mixed use destinations. Also read malls. Uh, they have announced a partnership with Adept Mind. It's a tech company that focuses on AI and e-commerce applications. And together they've built something they're calling Shop Now. And Shop Now is an omnichannel platform. And what it's going to allow uh, customers at Centennial to do, there it's the first in the U.S. according to this group. Um, it's going to allow them to go to Centennial's platform, Shop Now. They can type in red shoes, and they will get the return results of red shoes in every single store in every one of the Centennial properties. So not just the mall that they're looking at, but any one of the properties. And when they find, they can find the red shoes, they can find all the the other uh, pieces that they like throughout their shopping experience in this app. They are all put into one cart. And right now, uh, shoppers have to check out independently. So they've, they're going to have to pay independently for each retailer uh, and figure out shipping configurations within reach, each retail for this first phase. But then the second phase, they're hoping to consolidate that cart into one checkout, one pickup for this completely seamless shopping experience um, for the Centennial customers, which again, you know, this is, this is looking at it from the other side where we have the physical malls and how they're trying to come the, uh, towards the other end of the spectrum and going, going virtual, giving customers the opportunity to really get um, the best shopping experience possible. And I think um, one thing that I think they don't talk about yet in their phased approach, but could be really interesting is like when you talk about FitMatch, we interviewed Hanif Brown and you start to talk about how you're personalizing this search. So um, if I'm able to have kind of like the Netflix view of these are, this is how, these are the products that fit me to a 97% degree of confidence. And here's all the areas that they are. And these are all my pickup options for all these things. Like it starts to become this like crazy, awesome shopping experience. Um, so yeah, so much change, you guys. It's unbelievable. Yeah, so let, let's, there, there's a hell of a lot there. And there's a hell of a lot there, especially when you combine it with like the, the, the last story as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, just, we, we, were, we talked about this a while. I think we first introduced the idea in April that malls should have their own digital front end, basically, and act like a marketplace similar to Amazon. Someone is now doing it. And for all the detractors out there on LinkedIn that said this will never happen and, and decided to take the time on social media to write that, I say, it's happening. It's out there now. Like, look at it, okay? Now, there's a lot that has to happen. They have separate checkout in the first wave, like Ann said, and then they're going to consolidate it, but they're trying to do it. I actually just got word from Jesse Michael at Adept Mind, who's doing this with them. We're going to try to have them on our Spotlight Series podcast as well, so we can talk more about this and go right to the horse's mouth in terms of how this is all going to work. So I'm trying to coordinate that for you guys. So I'm excited about that. Email just came in as we're uh, doing this podcast. So question though, how does this all play out? Like, do we see physical locations being able to get into this marketplace space? Is it the brands that are going to end up winning this out? Is it going to be these new platforms like a goat? Balance it out. What proportion do you guys think? What do you think, Emma? I honestly don't know. I don't, I would need more time to think about that question. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a big think? question. I, I mean, it goes back to, I think, like the brands themselves and where, what's your whole portfolio going to look like? What marketplaces make strategic sense for you and what physical locations make strategic sense? Because it's not going to be anymore about, you know, I have, you know, locations, physical locations in every, you know, a mall in the country anymore. It's going to be like what this right mix, which will take some time. I think it's also understanding, you know, back to kind of the department store discussion, like 
we had the fashion industry where, you know, they, they're now going against what they had to do, which was create a blazer that had some unique component on it so that Barney's could sell it. That was different than the blazer that they'd right. sell to a Nordstrom. So it's like, do you start to get into the brands, you know, making special things that are exclusive so that people are going to one marketplace or one physical right. mall location over another? I mean, there's so much to this. Um, and the resale activity of all those brands. Exactly. Who plays it, into what, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then you have also, we, which we're not talking about the back of house operations, like all of the efficiencies that the malls are going to have to, or can go through when they start to consolidate all of these brands together. Um, or if the malls are owning some of the brands too, like what Simon's doing yeah, right. with authentic uh, grant, brands group. So I don't know, Chris, I mean, this is like a giant, like, just muddled mess right now but i i do think that there's a lot of promise yeah and it sounds like a great place to put money because giant messes tend to lead to great returns too i i I don't i think there's i think there's room for both here where i think the expression of a physical place in this manner especially at the local level like we just talked about at the very beginning with mall of america like here are all the experiences you can indulge in here all the brands and products you can indulge in and how do we all coordinate that concierge that for you almost in a way that's very unique to the local dynamics of what's happening. I think that can exist. And then I think there are these national plays and you're right. I think Emma too, like it's hard to understand in terms of who's going to carve that out. You know, is it a Nike that makes this play like we've talked about? Is it, you know, these standalone platforms, it's probably going to be some function of both, but, and to your point, I think it's going to be hard for some to try to do that, even though they're going to attempt to do it. Uh, and it'll ultimately consolidate. I mean, it feels like everything over time in capitalism, I said this on a podcast the other day that I was being interviewed for, everything in capitalism over time does do that. So, it'll, but it, seem, it seems, it's seemingly now happening. And again, it just goes to that play of discovery in the online world. How's it going to happen? And it's going to happen more and more. And that hasn't even hit the specialty retail industry and the department store industry yet. Also, basically, we haven't brought Shopify into the conversation too. Which or is like, Amazon. <laughs> right. And that's why Shopify, if you're not, like we've talked about it too, malls, start talking to those guys because there's a lot of things they could do to augment your assortment and what you do in that physical world. And they probably already have the capabilities to do some of this with you if you're smart in terms of how you want to think about it. So, all right, well, let's close it up. The last feel good story. I know Anne loves this one because she sent it to me on a Sunday and it is that Walmart has added a twist to their latest Walmart Plus program. And this twist helps their shoppers revisit the missed moments in their lives. Yes, according to Chain Store Age, one of the best reads in retail, by the way, Walmart Plus is launching a new program called Walmart Plus Up. It's designed to provide select customers with experiences they've missed and could not under, otherwise undergo during the pandemic. The first Walmart, what they're calling Plus Up event, happens Sunday, September 28th. Elliot Fagley, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that name, if I'm pronouncing that name incorrectly, who's an anesthesiologist who leads the critical care unit of COVID-19's response at Virginia Mason Medical Center in Seattle and his family will be the only family in attendance for an NFL pro football team, uh, Seattle Seahawks home opener, and they will raise the 12th man flag. During the next 12 months, the Walmart Plus initiative will also feature a number of other things like immersive Halloween trunk or treat, trunk or treat, yes, I said that right, contact-free trick-or-treating experiences, home classroom setups, wedding redos, virtual Thanksgivings with all the trimmings, at-home movie theaters, social distance birthday parties, quinceañeras, and at-home vacations, and lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, Walmart Plus. And why do you love this so much? Well, first and foremost, I have to give a shout out to all the creative teams out there. Can we come up with something else but the plus? Everybody's doing the plus. And plus up. I mean, you guys, you're more creative. You're at home. Find some inspiration, please. All right. Uh, I do think that this is... I love it. It's so hokey and dorky. I think it is. I love it. Plus up. I know, but I also think, like, I I posted on LinkedIn about this, too. What I think is really, really fun about this is that Walmart, while they were kind of focusing their sites on Amazon and kind of competing directly with Amazon the last couple weeks, this one seems like it goes directly for, like, this is Target's MO. This This is, like, Target's scene, and I think that this is Walmart kind of coming in and and really owning their position as a like fundamental part of these communities 
700 communities all around the country and Walmart is at the heart of them and they're owning it. Like finally you're taking some like feel good ownership and trying to change what might've been the former Walmart, Walmart mindset. Um, and, and I think is going to be, if they can pull this off, um, like we talked about in the first Amazon story, you know, retailers really establishing themselves um, as more than just selling you stuff. What other opportunities are there as retail kind of uh, gets its, its uh, spread, I guess, across the, the country. And Walmart's able to do this better than Amazon is for the time being, but who knows yeah. with all those Montessori's coming in. But You're right. Who, who knows if, you know, former Target uh, marketing exec, William White took this over to you know, you know, took his target ethos over to Walmart, who knows where this comes from. But yeah, it feels well, great. definitely that no matter way. what, like, yes. you know, it feels like it's right in that sweet spot that traditionally belonged to a target. Emma, are you, are you loving this? Or are you like jaded like us? Or is this making you feel all warm and fuzzy uh, as well? I like it a lot. I definitely agree with Anne's point where in order to like really win the loyalty of your customers, you need to do more than just sell products. And when you can actually create experiences for people, I think that's what's really going to be important going forward. Yeah, I think it's cool. They're just, they're playing on this whole fly. But I, the more I look at this, the more I love just the Walmart Plus program in general. I mean, I started going into crazy, like, streams of conscious with that this week. Like, I started to look up Sam's Club memberships. They're like 45 bucks a year. Like, what if that becomes part of the Walmart yeah. Plus program? Like, just by default, that seems like a total no-brainer to me. I asked Walmart to comment if they're thinking about that, but they won't tell me anything in relation to that. Not surprisingly, but I'm trying to stay on it for you folks. But uh, yeah, it's cool. I love it. I think they're just doing some really smart stuff here all along. And even this week, Emma, right? We Walmart dominated our top talk. Like the first time ever, all four stories were from one, one company. I think it was on Monday just because they were doing all kinds of crazy new cool stuff, like financing small businesses, opening healthcare units. So Kudos to, to Walmart. It seems like Doug McMillan and John Ferner have really got that thing on the rails right now. All right. Well, that wraps us up. A special happy birthday to everyone's favorite, Kevin Sorbo, as I, or as I know him, Hercules. The always dreamy Ben Platt. And of course, the late Phil Hartman and Jim Henson. We ran remember, into Ben Platt, didn't we? We but did. We ran into we Ben Platt in New York. When we were at NRF. Yeah, he was walking his dog. He totally geeked out. He like did, freaked totally out like, ah, it's Ben I, Platt. And I was like, I, who the hell are we? That's doing? a little bit of an exaggeration, but yes, a good friend <laughs> of ours. He's a big fan of Ben Platt, so I tried to text him immediately. All right, and remember, if you can only read or listen to one retail blog in the business, please make it Omni Talk. Our Fast Five podcast is the quickest, fastest rundown of all the week's top news, and our twice-weekly newsletter tells you the top five things you need to know each day and also features special content exclusive to us and just for you, all within the preview pane of your inbox. You can sign up today at www.omnitalk.blog. Thanks, as always, for listening in. Please remember to like and leave us a review wherever you happen to listen to your podcasts or watch them on YouTube. And of course, be careful out there.